chapter 19, we see Queen Jezebel, and that's her peoples that got wiped out. So she is, you know, she's not too happy, to put it mildly. And she comes breathing threats against Elijah. She threatens his life. And Elijah has a moment of weakness. He gives into his fear, and he flees the scene. God finds him, and he's like, you know, what you doing here? And Elijah has his pity party, which we're all known to do at some point in time. And he's like, you know, I've been putting all this work. I've been faithful. I've been zealous. And for what? You know, all the other prophets have been killed by, by Jezebel and Ahab, and I'm the only one that's left, and now they're after me. So God just put me out of my misery. No one's got my back. It's not even worth continuing. You know, I mean, you can almost hear the violence playing in the background. And, and, and so God comes in, and he's like, yo, let me correct your alternative facts. Ain't nothing special about you. You know, you, know, you don't have a monopoly on tribulation, on persecution, on being faithful. Peep this. I have 7,000 brothers and sisters on my squad who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So, so don't get it twisted like you got something that, that they don't have. And eventually Elijah gets back on mission. And going into chapter 20, we see ben of Syria rear his ugly head again. Now we saw him a couple episodes ago when we read the account of King Asa in 2 Chronicles chapter 16 about how he could have wiped out all of the Syrians if he had done things God's way. But he went his way got some little victory, but he let the, the Syrians get away. They escaped to fight another day. And now they're knocking on Samaria's door. They're, they're about to siege the city. This is the capital of Israel. And um, Benadad, he's like, you know, well, I've heard, you know, let me see if I can punk King Ahab because I've heard he's kind of this sniveling coward. So let me see what I can get out of him. So he sends some messages to Ahab. He's like, yeah, um, I'm going to need you to give me your wives and your children and your silver and your gold. Okay, thanks. And true to form, Ahab is like, oh, uh, yes, sir, Master Boss, whatever you say. I'll get that over to you right away. Yeah, yes, sir. And Ben is like, whoa, that was too easy. You know, what else can I squeeze out of him? And so he goes back to him and he's like, yeah, also, I'm going to need you to go ahead and let my ministers come through all of your houses. They'll take whatever they want. And I'm going to just need you to, to look the other way. OK, it's time to render to Caesar. We're going to tax you a little bit. Thanks. So Ahab goes crawling to the elders of Israel and he's like, man, you know, I gave him everything he asked for. I, you know, he asked for my money. He asked for my wives. He just won't stop picking on me. What should I do? And the elders are like, bruh. Go a backbone. Like, 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 just tell him this is not acceptable. We ain't acquiescing to nothing. And Ahab goes slinking back to Benadad, like, sir, Master Boss, uh, you know, the first thing you asked for, that was that was cool. But the second thing, uh, I don't know. I don't know if we'll be able to do it, sir. And that's all Benadad was waiting for. Like, he was going to take him out anyway, but he was looking for an excuse. <laughs> so he's like, you want to go to war? We'll take you to war. And he marshals his troops. He's about to march against Samaria. But an interesting thing happens. A prophet shows up, and you know, this could be Elijah. We're not given the prophet's name. It's probably one of the other people that God has reserved, one of his faithful people. And the prophet goes to Ahab and is like, um, yo, you see this, this multitude of Syrians that are talking trash and they're trying to march against you? God's going to deliver them into your hand. And Ahab, you know, he knows he's not doing it right. So he's looking around like, well, he can't be talking to me. Like, wait, you talking to me, <laughs> wicked king uh, Ahab? And the prophet says, yeah, you. And so Ahab says, oh, bet. You know, so he, he puts, he gets his troops together and they go out and they fight the Syrians and they have, they have a great victory. They win. And the Syrians retreat. The Benadad gets away. He's on a horse. So obviously he can outrun uh, the Israeli foot soldiers. And the prophet comes back to Ahab and says, you ain't seen nothing yet. So the Syrians regroup, and in verse 23, we see what, you know, their explanation as to why they were defeated by the inferior army of the Israelites. Verse 23 says, And the, serv the servant of the king of Syria said to him, Their gods are gods of the hills. Therefore, they were stronger than we. But if we fight against them in the plain, surely we'll be stronger than they. So this is their mentality as to why things went south. But, but in verse 28, we see God is not having any of this tugging on his cape, putting him on the same plane as these fake gods of wood and stone. So, so, so he, he sends the prophet back to King Ahab 
and, and he says, because the Syrians have said, this is verse 28, the Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore, I will deliver all this great multitude into your hand and you shall know that I am Yahweh. And so they fight once again, Israel versus the Syrians and the Israelites kill 100,000 Syrians in one day. And the Syrians retreat back to the city and the wall falls on top of them and 27,000 more of them get wiped out. Of course, Benadad gets away like the villain always seems to get away. But this was his great miracle that's performed on behalf of a king, a wicked king, Ahab, who ended up not even repenting. But this was an act of God to try to convince both the Syrians who were idol worshipers and Ahab and those bystanders watching from a distance. And, and I like to believe that somebody was converted because of this, because there was now no doubt that Jehovah was God. I would also submit that God did this because of the few righteous, faithful individuals who were among the people, the prophets and those who stood up to the oppression of Ahab and Jezebel. So what's the application for you? You're at your job, you're in class at school, you and your family, wherever your locale, wherever your sphere of influence is. And like Elijah, you might think that you're the only one. You know, no one else is faithful. What's the point of you even trying to be transparent? What kind of influence, what kind of impact can just you have all by yourself? But God is willing to go above and beyond to prove to those people in your life who don't have the faith that you do that faith in him is worth it. He's willing to prove to that person who doesn't know about waiting on God, doesn't know about the peace that passes understanding, he will give them a free sample. You know, like you go to the food court at the mall and there are folks who are handing out free samples because, you know, you've never had that food before, presumably, so you taste it and that entices you to buy the full meal. God will offer free samples to those who have never tried them, who have never tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And, and so you think you don't have any influence, but because of your faithfulness, because of your unwillingness to compromise, even if everyone is telling you that what is wrong is OK, even if the whole world is telling you to move and you're willing to plant yourself like a tree and look in the eye and be like, nah, you move. God will bless and work a miracle through 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 you on the strength of that.